I feel just about as good as I sound, and if you like the sound of my voice, that's great, but I'm trying to tell you I'm fucking sick, and this matters for you because it inspired the idea for this tutorial. You remember when Zuko's sick and Iroh's like, Zuko, you have to not to be sick, whatever, whatever it is he says. He puts a hot towel on his forehead, and when I was in delirium in the bed over here, my fiancé kept me alive. <laughs> I could choose so much wood. Pretty much, that was pure delirium. And the point is that involved hot towels as well. And when I was setting them up, you know, I had to add hot water and then wring them out to get like the overflow. So this twisting motion that intelligently knows where water should eject from. That's what this is about. I'm gonna make a cloth that I'm then gonna pin to two sides so that I can twist it. And then we're gonna use some fancy math to calculate the strain, isolate those sections or consider that a vertex group where we emit fluid from and then do a whole bunch of blending. and. We'll get into the technicals. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, and we're going to talk about that later. The first order of business, like I said, is making our cloth that I want to be subject to gravity. In other words, it's going to go downwards on the Z, but I want it to kind of face upwards in a sense. So I'm going to rotate it to face like up and down the Y axis, make that a tiny bit smaller, control A to apply scale because that seems to matter for physics, and then just a bunch of loop cuts. Not too many because then simulation takes forever and it actually gets glitchier at a certain point. If I take this now and turn it into a cloth object like a wee, it's going to fall because there's nothing holding it up. It's just subject to gravity, nothing to catch it, nothing to pin it. That's what we need. We need pins. So go into edit mode. I'm going to say what sections do I want kind of like on a clothesline, like what sections that I say don't move. Well, that's going to be this edge selection over here. Shift alt click this one over here. And to take this selection and say cloth simulation, respect it, keep it in place. Hit control G to turn this into a vertex group. That group is going to have a name. You can call it whatever, not COVID. I don't know. <laughs> Who's to say? But what? What is going on? Yes, yes, cloth simulation. So for the cloth shape, which is where we can say what to and not to pin, you use, use your not COVID group. And now when you simulate, just like that, it will hold still there. Now we need a bit more than that. This side over here should not only be still, but it should be rotating. Like we're doing like a laffy taffy or just taffy pulling mach machine salt. One end is held, the other one's, you get it. <sighs> And do it for the love of the craft. Okay, well that's super simple to do because what I can do is I can take this pin and connect it to a rotating object. You'd be tempted to do that with parenting, but a even better way is there's something called a hook modifier. This should exist before the cloth because I'm going to say hook onto this object and then you can start simulating. What you can do with a hook is you can specify an object. So I'm going to make this empty over here. I'm going to tell our hook to reference this empty and then what should be turning. Well, it's not the not COVID group that is everything. It should only be one end. So I'm going to make a fresh vertex group. So just this edge over here, control G to assign to a new group again. This one I can call Delirium Saturday. Make that the vertex group. And now if I click play, well, nothing happens. But when I uh, move the empty, something does happen. So this is nice because you can see it still respects the uh, stretching and compression. Like it will do everything it can to like resist these insane motions. Some of those insane motions include rotation. So to rotate this over time, instead of uh, keyframes, I'm going to rotate about the X axis by taking the frame number. So hash frame number divided by let's say 20. And this will just have it slowly, slowly rotate. This is something we expect to become unstable and it's kind of passing through itself, which of course makes sense because we didn't tell the cloth that you're not allowed to do that. So while the cloth knows what it is and is not attached to, we should also say in the collisions that you have self collisions. You don't intersect your own mesh. You want to play this, make sure it's stable. The gap between these is going to be exactly defined, by the way, by this distance. So if you make this distance smaller, it's going to allow these edges and faces to get a bit closer to each other. But again, that can cause instability and you can see that happening happening right there. So there's probably tricks for this. The most obvious to me is increase the quality of your collisions and we don't actually need object collisions and increase the quality of your plot simulation. Hope for the best. So that simulated super quickly and it is about as stable as you can expect because if you think about a cloth being this like heavy towel thing, it's heavy and you twist it. Once you twist it this much, you have like superhuman strength. I know it's only two turns, but just, you know, get on my wavelength with this one, please. And now that we have this, I want to emit fluid or particles. We're going to use a liquid simulation because Manta Flow has that covered for us. We need a way to tell the simulation where water should and shouldn't come out. In other words, it's these areas of high strain, we call it. You can call it tension, compression. I don't think either of those are technically the right word. But we measure which sections like the liquid should be coming out of based on, imagine that all these edges have a certain length that start off basically the same. So let's say they all have a length of one. As this plays along, you're going to see that it will 
try to keep the same length because otherwise it becomes bigger than it was before, but it, it does allow for a bit of stretchiness. And because it changes just a little, we're going to take the current length of each edge. We're going to subtract the length that it was originally. So to begin with, all of these were equal to one, but maybe now some are like 1.1 or 0.99, whatever. We take this change in length and then we divide by the original length. And that is called the strain term. You might notice that this could be positive or negative depending on if the length got bigger or smaller. And that's great because we have strain that relates to like stretching a thing versus compressing a thing, different kinds of strains. You can think of their absolute value as like the magnitude of strain. So let's throw on some geometry nodes, which we can absolutely do post simulation. I love that you can build on things. That's what makes this project possible, by the way. We are going to add geo nodes. And sorry, I don't have my good layout that shows the nodes really well. I'm out and about and I, I just I don't have my setup. So I'm sorry. But what we want to do is we want to calculate this edge length strain idea. So for each edge, an edge has two vertices. We can call it vertex one and vertex two, each with their own position. And if we think of our edge as having these two points, its length is exactly the distance between them. So literally take position one, calculate the distance to position two. It doesn't matter which order you do this in because the distance from A to B is the same as B to A. This I'm going to turn into a node group with a output. I'm going to call this length because we're going to be using it quite a bit. And I now can calculate length on the fly, but I also want to know the original length. Now the issue is because this is simulated, it is changing every single frame. In fact, if I store the length as a edge attribute, so I'm just going to call this length, and I go to the edge domain, you can see we have all these lengths over here. And as I play, you're going to see some some of them flicker, not by much, because we don't expect them to change by much, but they do change. And these microscopic changes is exactly what we want to measure, so if we're not accounting for those, that's a big problem. So somehow we need to capture the length at the first frame and then compare it to the current frame. Lots of ways to do this, but now that we're in the modern age, I'm going to use the bake node. It freezes a state, a geometry, a simulation, at a certain frame. So if I go to frame 1, the very beginning, I connect this to the bake, and I bake this, you can see this is stored at frame 1. So if I play this, you can see it's playing, 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 but if I looked at the bake one, the baked one he who bakes it doesn't change and now we can uh, compare the two so for this length i want to get it from this uh, baked group stored on the edge domain so what i'm going to do is i'm going to sample the index of this baked geometry for this length attribute that will be calculated on the edges and for the indexing i'm just going to use the index itself because every edge should be compared to its equivalent so edge 35 even if it's 100 frames down should still be looking at edge 35 from the original thing each edge should uh, look at its corresponding one and now that we have this remember our formula is the current length minus this is the original length and then all of that is divided by the current length okay so super simple equation and this should give us the strain that can be positive or negative if i view our geometry so this is the current geometry not the baked one and i view this custom attribute we made that is strain and i visualize this you're gonna see nothing and i think that's because we're looking at it from the wrong perspective this is a thing we're comparing edges to edges so by default i think it looks at points so i'm gonna say look at the edges and now you can see we have our strain map and just as you might expect it starts off black there's no strain but then we get lots of strain towards the middle maybe even some negative behavior all the interesting stuff happens um, in the middle and maybe in these like very tight folds and that is what i want to extract hey everybody this video is brought to you by squarespace the best place to make a website online not that you would make it offline but my website www.cgmatter.com is made and hosted with squarespace this is where i upload my blend files and assets and whatever and that is made simple because of Squarespace features like their payment system because I'm using this as a Patreon alternative and payments would kind of be the hardest part of that. So Squarespace payments has all the credit card PayPal stuff just integrated as well as an asset library which lets me store my GIFs, my JPEGs, my PNGs, my PNGs all in one convenient place. And then three tertiary release. There's a lot of integration including AI integration which if you want can really streamline the process of designing and just filling in filler stuff. Head over to Squarespace and try making a website and when you're ready to take that and launch you can use this link below in the description to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Uh... Okay so how do we get something useful out of this? Well first of all I want to smooth it out a little so I'm going to blur this attribute this strain map by maybe two iterations because there isn't much geometry and you can see that this section is quite black this is quite black this is the brightest. I can extract certain sections of interest. In other words let's take where this blurred attribute is greater than a certain number. We could just kind of pick a little domain here. And I think, I mean, let's just look at it. I think white represents areas of high strain, although it's kind of lagging behind. And it would make sense that there's strain where it's being held, right? Because it's trying to resist that motion. So that's one option. Let's try less than, less than zero. 
So this actually behaves kind of more what I would expect it to. It kind of accumulates in these folds towards the interior. I think I like that. And by the way, the reason I'm doing all this is I'm going to separate the mesh. I'm not going to make a vertex group because that doesn't work with fluid simulations. I'm going to separate the mesh and say, keep the parts of it that should be simulating. So for example, I can uh, separate geometry by the selection. And when I view it, you can see only certain areas exist where I want the thing to spawn. But I want this to be higher resolution. Here's what I propose we do. Before we subdivision surface or anything like that, we need to store our progress. Because otherwise, if we add geometry, the indexing of all of this stuff kind of goes away. I'm going to store this over here. I can call that, it can be on the points, I can call that strain, for example. So now if I look at our strain attribute, what I expect, hopefully, I know like there's domain issues about, does not like that, should it be on edge? Yeah, now we have that. But if I subdivision surface, so what I'm hoping, let's see, subdivision surface, uh, didn't like that, did it? What am I doing wrong? I feel like there's something super obvious I'm missing, but maybe let's just transfer it by looking at the nearest surface or something. In other words, what I want to do is I want to sample the nearest surface. So remember, this and the subdivision surface are identical. It's just that one smoother than another. They're kind of occupying the same space. I want to sample the nearest like low resolution thing and bring it to the high res one. What is it that I want to sample? Well, it should be its strain attribute, just like that. And then we can just view it, right? So here is our original, and then here is our modified one, which glitchy it may be, but not bad. I mean, that's pretty believable to me. Those are areas where water could eject. Well, let's kind of finish up here. I'm going to separate geometry, as in I want to keep only certain parts of it. For the selection, I'm going to say where the strain is less than zero. In other words, you have this pulling, I, I think, uh, something like that. And we can evaluate on faces, since I want full geometry. I don't want, like, these, like, strands over here. Okay. And then, by the way, even on top of this, you could get greedy. Another subdivision surface if you want to smooth, but I don't think that will be necessary. I think the only thing I want to change is that there is some, like, stuff in the beginning as it's, like, starting to settle. So maybe we'll say nothing before frame, like, 35 counts. I'm going to switch geometry between this and nothing, right? So this lets me go back and forth. And the condition is that the frame number, use a scene time node for that, the frame number is bigger than 35, in which case you can do our calculation. Let's admit water from this bad boy. To emit liquid, it's generally just as simple as anything else, any other kind of fluid simulation you've done, where I'm literally going to take this, I'm going to run our quick liquid to set it up, but you're going to notice that even on frame 35 and beyond, nothing's going to happen. There's a few reasons for this. One, we have a super, a super low resolution voxel grid, like this is a giant voxel compared to these tiny faces, so there's not enough detail. Second of all, our domain, where the thing's being calculated, is way too big. I mean, this is the area we care about, and look at this big bound. And then third of all, it tends to like solidified geometry. So this is like a infinitely thin plane or fragments of infinitely thin planes. All of these are very, very solvable. So before we do the fluid, I'm just going to add a solidify modifier, put that in right before. You can see that's adding some nice thickness. That doesn't need to be too much, but this is good enough for me. I then want to take our liquid domain and really scale it to just what we need. This can actually be done in edit mode instead of like object space transforms. I'm just going to move this down to be right at the top of the towel. This actually doesn't need to go too far down because the water is just going to escape. I don't need it to collect on the floor or anything for my use case, which will actually make it run really fast because every generated particle escapes quite quickly. Maybe we can go a little bit lower, go to the top view, make sure we're not taking up too much Y space. I think we have something a bit better or more optimized at least. I'm going to apply rotation and scale and do the set origin to geometry thing. I don't know if it matters, but whatever. So we now have our voxel. Great. If I now take this and bring up the subdivisions, at this point, you would expect it to work. So let's see what happens. I'm going to bring it up to 100, which you can see makes that little voxel here much tinier. So we play, we play, we play, we wait for frame 35 and nothing. OK, why is that the case? Well, right now what it's doing is we have a liquid domain. This is where it's simulating. We have our plane over here, which I'm just going to call our towel that is emitting liquid. And we have our empty that's helping with the cloth simulation. The thing about our fluid emitter, this uh, towel, is if we go to its fluid properties, you can see it's actually emitting liquid out of the geometry, which you think is great, like amazing. No, it's not amazing. What it means is it will take your object on the first frame, convert that into liquid, and that's it. And then it splashes. Whereas I want this to be like a ongoing stream. So it's the difference between a faucet and just going up and down real quick. What we're looking for, the word is uh, inflow. And what inflow does is exactly what I just described. So when we go to frame 35, there we go. 
And you can see it's only emitting in areas that we care about. And it's doing the hard work for us. And it is doing the splashes if you want. I don't. And we can get a lot faster. If we go to our liquid domain, I actually don't need anything on the floor, any kind of collisions with the boundary. So you just disable those. It will fall right through and then just delete itself. What else can we do? We also don't need meshing. You might wonder what is meshing? Meshing is, you see all these like colorful dots and everything. But then when I go to solid view, you have this, what can only be described as a mesh. I don't need that. I actually only need the particles because we can mess with those in geometry nodes, it turns out. You can extract information from a fluid. So we have a simulation going into geo nodes into another simulation back into geo nodes. So I'm just going to disable meshing and now it's going to be really, really much faster. And now you might wonder, it's like, okay, we have this and it's calculating, but there's like nothing there. If I hide this and I show my towel, maybe I'll make a duplicate towel where I'm going to call this one original. And the difference is this one's not going to have any of the extra stuff. It's not going to have a fluid simulation on it. It's not going to have this geo nodes. It's just going to be the cloth with a bit of thickness. And you can see now we have both cloths. One of them is like the original and one of them is the emitter. There's going to be no liquid, which is the thing. We didn't mesh. So how do we expect there to be liquid? Well, here's where the genius comes in, which is quite a bold statement. What you do is you take a object like a cube. I'm going to move it like five units on the X so it's out of the way. We can recover the fluid information into this cube. Well, remember, our liquid domain is just a bunch of particles, really, because we, we skipped meshing. So with this cube selected, I'm going to add a modifier called like an instancer, particle instance. If there's a particle system, on another object we can hijack it we can say ours mine i take it and that's what we're gonna do <laughs> okay so for the object select the liquid domain the thing that is simulating so not the emitter not the towel but the box around it so i'm gonna select the liquid domain it's gonna take a second and that's a good thing because it's saying i just put a cube in every single particle position which is great it means that it works but there's a lot of particles and therefore a lot of cubes and it's gonna intersect and be nasty what i would recommend is i'm actually gonna hide this modifier i'm gonna take this cube which is what is being instanced right so if i make it 10 times smaller and I view this, you can see now it's kind of taking the shape more. In edit mode, I'm going to take this cube M, merge at center. So now it's a single vertex. You can't even see it. But now uh, these points come in as vertices. So this you can think of as our particle system, which when we bake, we can, you know, bake this, whatever. So I'm going to move this back five units. So it's overlapping our towel. I can hide the towel and show the original. And now let's see this mess. It's twisting, it's twisting, and then water comes out at areas of high tension. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, that is way too much water. I agree with you and you can play with the settings, but because it's in geo nodes, we can do something at least about it. And what do I expect to do about it? Well, after the particle instance, I can add a geometry nodes, which just like anything else is going to let me move these like vertices as if they were anything else. In fact, they are vertices. So I want to go mesh two points so that we treat this like a nice stable point cloud. I'm going to make that radius super tiny. And then, you know, to make it less fluid, you could just delete most of the drops, right? So here I made a very simple like deletion setup where it deletes points based on a probability. So let's say it deletes 0. 0.999. Is that stable? Let's see what that does. So it's going to... No, it is not because the index is shifting. So this is getting rid of 999.9% of the particles, but it's not stable. So let's think if we can find a way around that. Okay, so we can't really keep track of them is what I'm finding, at least not easily. And we somehow need to have less of them. So the solution obviously is to simulate with less particles, which I think you can define in the flip fluid settings. But I'm going to take the if you can't beat them, join them mentality very literally. If I cannot beat them, delete the points, I'm going to take nearby ones and join them together. If you can't beat them, join them. And if every pair of points comes kissing together, it will look like there are half as many points. Here is how I intend to do that. Every single point, like let's say this one over here, has a nearest neighbor, something it's closest to. If they happen to be each other's nearest neighbors, they can each go halfway and meet in the middle. I don't want to go too deep into this because I am, I feel like a new fever is coming about, but that's just because I'm sitting weird. I'm using so much of my brain. Um, what am I trying to do? Index of nearest will tell us the index of the nearest thing, of the nearest point, and I'm going to evaluate at that index. I want to evaluate the position. In other words, for every point, tell me its nearest position. And then we are going to set position, not here, which might like swap them, but you know, halfway in between. I'm going to mix the original position with this 50-50. And now let's kind of zoom out and see what we did here. So this is before and after. I think I'm comfortable saying that's half the density. And because a lot of them should be overlapping now, I can totally run a merge by distance, which will take overlapping ones and just make them the same. And this should still be pretty continuous because the underlying flow is continuous, which would make you think the nearest neighbor is pretty continuous. So here we're really hijacking the idea of continuity. So here you see we have 58,000 points. After one iteration, we're down to 40,000. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, it's my idea. Give it back. I'm going to control G, make this a node group. I copy it. And every single time we call 
I don't know, it seems like about a third each time, but it's like continuous. That's the beauty of it. And you don't even need to re-simulate. I'm just gonna throw this inside of a repeat zone and then I gotta do a good night call for everybody. Boom, 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 boom. Look at that. Continuous, less points. Okay, I gotta go. I hope this was useful.